Hi everyone, this is Josh. As you know, this channel is all about Solana development. But in this video, I'm going to take a step back and explore the fundamentals of Solana to help build conviction for the bag I'm holding, or I mean, investment. So I'm sure during the glory days of 2020, we all did our due diligence before we made a large investment into Solana. Now, let me ask you a question. Does anyone actually know how Solana works or even crypto in general? Well, let's find out by talking to our longtime friend, our local Cardano show and crypto expert, Scott. So Scott, why did you invest in crypto and get me into this? Well, Josh, back in 2017, I was a young man with hope and pride. Of course, I would like to invest in the technology and the technology would make the price goes up. So as you can clearly see, we're all clueless and really have no idea what we invested in. So I thought in this video, we'll explore how Solana works and really try to understand what was it that I invested in and maybe if I should dump my bags, especially now after the recent dump from $40 to $26 at the time of this recording. Spoiler alert, I'm still a fan. So to understand the Solana architecture, I had to dig into the Solana white paper, their documentation, and some Googling around. And while the deeper I dig, the more questions I had, I think overall in this video, I have a pretty good understanding of Solana, how Solana works. But if there's something I missed, do leave it in the comments below. So the first thing is no shame. I took the, in the Solana white paper, I decided to take the, their network architecture diagram. So as you can see, uh, here's the basic diagram of how Solana works. On the, what the red arrows are pointing to, we have the transaction that users are sending to our Solana cluster. So every cluster has a leader node. These are the nodes that our users talk to uh, to do the proof of history, more on that later. And what these leader node does is that they generate these hashes, but we'll just call them transactions for now. And so what the leader node does is it generates these, I guess, blocks in this picture of, ha of hashes, which are the transactions. And these combined together form a block. And then once you have these blocks, the verifier nodes will actually check to ensure that whatever the leader node is generating is actually a valid block. It's not some sort of malicious block. And then once the verifier has verified that the block is correct, they send the end state of that verification. More on that as, as we continue. And then once the verifier nodes are finished validating through the whole block, all of the transaction hashes you see over here, it will have a final end state, which then it will send back to the leader, which will decide to commit this block to the ledger or not. And, that's, and that roughly on the high level is how Solana works. I'm going to go into a lot more details of, these, of this whole entire process. So let's start with the first question. How is a leader selected? So first thing, a leader is a node chosen from a cluster of nodes, you know, these verifiers, essentially. And they are used to process the transaction from the users. So now that we know what a leader is, let's go look at the white paper. So inside the white paper itself, uh, it doesn't really clearly describe how a leader is picked, but it says right here that a election for a new proof of history generator occurs when a proof of history generator fail failure is detected. And the validator with the largest voting power or highest public key address, if there's a tie, is picked as the new proof of history generator. Uh, specifically what this means is that whichever validator has the most users staking their salon in on it will become the new leader. And I thought, well, that's not very efficient. Whoever has the most soul is essentially always the leader. And so I dug a little more into the Solana doc, and here's what I found. So inside the Solana documentation itself, there's actually a thing called a leader schedule, which is a list of identities of all slot leaders. How this works is that there's a leader schedule that is created over a period of time. And how this works is that each schedule has a slot where a node can be a leader. And during that period of time, that node will basically operate the whole Solana network, handling and processing transaction through the proof of history generator, which we'll talk about later. And this period of time is called epoch. And so if we actually scroll down and read further, there is an algorithm that kind of shows how it is done. You can read it right here, but I have made a visual demonstration of this. So let's take a look at how it works. All right, so here's a part of our network architecture. We have our leader nodes or transactions that we have our leader node, which generates the proof of history transactions, and then they go into the verifier nodes and the verifier nodes will process each transaction and make sure that they are legitimate and they reproduce a final state. 
So how we generate a leader schedule is that we take all the verifier nodes that are actively verifying the transactions, and these nodes would be set into an active set. And then from this active set of nodes, we would sort it by the nodes that have the greatest amount of soul staked into it. And then from there, the leader node would generate a arbitrary seed. And this seed is used to arbitrarily pick and assign the nodes in a certain epoch for the leader schedule. How the order of the nodes are picked using the seed phrase was not described in the white paper or the doc, so we can only assume. But on a high level, this is how it works. So, so far, so good. Uh, every node has a chance, and my investment is safe. All right, so at this point, we have a high level idea of the Solana architecture and how a leader selection works. And now we're going to the most important part, the proof of history algorithm that Solana is known for. So we know that leader generate transactions, which are actually hashes, more of that later, using proof of history. But what is proof of history? I'm glad you asked. Let's find out. So before we talk about how proof of history works, let's talk about what proof of history is and what is it even trying to solve. So proof of history essentially is an algorithm that creates a time ordering to allow validator nodes to determine the order of incoming blocks that the leader generates. But just to be clear, proof of history is not another mining protocol like proof of work or proof of stake. Proof of history is more of a consensus mechanism that's used by the other two algorithms to create ordering. And we'll see why that's important soon. So to be extra clear, Solana uses proof of stake and is further enhanced by using their proof of history algorithm. To understand the purpose of it, let's go back and look at how proof of work works with the Bitcoin network. So to mine Bitcoin, we have computers randomly trying to guess a hash so that they can be the first person or node to produce a block in the Bitcoin network. And then that block is then distributed across every node in the Bitcoin network. And that lays the problem. It takes time to propagate those blocks to each validator node, because as you can imagine, they are literally across the road and for Bitcoin to work successfully and be decentralized, every node needs to both validate the block and converge on a certain order. But as you can see, if we have a lot of blocks being sent out to every node in existence, th there could be network problems that cause us to lose the ordering of the blocks. And so how this is solved is that we make the hash that the miners have to try and guess for a lot bigger. And on average, what Bitcoin does is it tries to ensure that it takes roughly 10 minutes for a miner to generate a block. So by setting this hash difficulty, we allow the validators a lot more time to receive the blocks validated and converge on a certain order. So how does proof of history solve this? Well, proof of history creates a verifiable time ordering, so we don't actually need to wait for the validators and just continue processing the transactions. So in this diagram right here, you see that the leader generates, you know, blocks, it generates block 1001, 1002, and it just goes on and goes. And because we have these number ordering or time ordering, all the validator nodes know the order of the blocks, even if they receive them in, in a incorrect ordering. And the benefit of not having to wait for these blocks is that we don't have to pay as high of a gas fee as what you might see in Ethereum or Bitcoin. And because we don't have any self-imposed timeouts, Solana can process as many transactions as it can physically compute, giving us the high transactions per second that Solana is known for. So now we know what the purpose of proof of history is. Let's find out how proof of history works. For example, how do we guarantee that the chain of blocks that the leader generates is actually valid? And to do that, we need to understand hashing. So a quick recap, hashing is a way to transform a, any given input to a different output. So in this example, uh, if we're given the word Solana, we give it to a hash function in Java, for example, it would generate this string. And so there are two important properties of the of any hash functions. And that's one, the same input will always generate the same output. And the second important property is that the output is always a randomly distributed string value uh, that can't be predicted. For example, if I were to put Solana 1, I would, could get a completely different ha output versus Solana. So while it might be theoretically possible that a two separate input might have the same output, the chances of that is so infinitesimally small that it's not really a problem. All right, so how does proof of history use hashing? So what Solana does with proof of history is that we start with a seed phrase, or not just any starting word, uh, let's say Solana. And we take Solana and then we run it into a hash function to generate, let's say, hash one. And then with hash one, the output of our seed phrase, we use it 
as an input to the same hash function and we generate another hash value, let's say hash two. And then we just continue doing that indefinitely. And so we get a chain like this. So we have our proof of history generator node, uh, start of a seed phase. It uses the hash it generates to generate another hash and it just continues doing this perpetually. And the genius of how proof of history works is that because we are using hash functions that can't be predicted, the only way we can get hash one is if we were to use the Solana C phase in our hash function. And the only way we can get hash two is if we were to use hash one as our input. And so by perpetually using the output of our hash function as our input, we can get create a we can create a constant of time because we know for sure that hash two must occur after hash one and Solana because hash one is used for hash two. So, okay, that's great. So now we have a, a list of hashes that can give us an idea what time, how much time has passed, but what, but how does that work with transactions? This, this is where the beauty of proof of history comes from. So, you know, you can imagine a node might just continue its loop of generating hashes. And then whenever a leader node receives a transaction from the user, all we need to do is we just take the hash of that transaction, combine it with whatever hash that we're currently on, let's say hash two, and use that to generate our new output, which is hash three. And then we use hash three as the input for our hash function to continue generating. So now by doing this, we have solidified that transaction one has occurred during the generation of hash two, giving us proof that transaction one have occurred before transaction two, for example. So here's a, a diagram of how this actually works. So as you see, users can send a magnitude of transactions to the leader node. And while that's happening, the leader node is just continuously generating hash. Let's say we're at hash 100. And so let's say the leader node receives transaction one when it's at pro uh, creating hash 100. We have the hash of transaction one and we just append it with hash 100 to create another hash. I'll call it hash 101. And then it just continuously generate these hashes. So as you can see, by continuing this, we can have recordable proof of the ordering of when transaction occurs so that validator knows later on can figure out the correct ordering of blocks even if they were to receive it out of order. Okay, so we have an idea of how proof history works now. We have these leader nodes generating these hashes, which are combined together eventually to form a block, which then we send to all the validator nodes to verify. So how does that work? And what are some of the optimizations that validators node have that allows proof history to work so quickly? Let's find out. All right, so here's where we left off. So we have our proof history leader generating all these hashes to eventually become a block. And at the very end of all these hashes, we have this final state. And what we do with these hashes in the final state is that we send it to the validator nodes to ensure that the block that the leader generates is valid and it's not a malicious leader. And so the validator nodes would go through and recalculate all the hashes following the same mechanism that we used to generate it. And then it would calculate the final state which is the final hash that we receive, and then send it back to the leader. If the leader receives a majority of the same final state that it has generated, it will commit the block it has proposed to the ledger. That's how this whole process works in a nutshell, but let's dive a bit deeper into how the validator nodes work. So we have a validator nodes and they just received a block of hashes. And so what each validator node does is it just takes all the hashes that the block generates and it just recomputes everything to ensure that chain that we received is legitimate. If, if it's not, we don't vote for it and the block's not committed. And so you might imagine that this process can be actually pretty slow because hash functions can't be predicted. So we have to recompute everything one by one. Well, that's actually not the case. You see, because we're given the full chain of hashes in our block, we can actually process all these hashes in parallel with each other because we know for a fact that the first hash we received, let's say hash 100, will have to give the output hash 101, which is the second value that we received. So if, if the generated hash, hash 101, is not the same as the second hash that we have, then we know that this block is not valid and we reject it. And the reason why this works so well is that a validator node can run this in parallel using a GPU. From the white paper, it said that a GPU can actually have 4,000 cores. So we can validate 4,000 hashes in parallel and generating hash function is super quick, so we could easily process hundreds of thousands of hash within of seconds. Don't quote me on that one, though. And then finally, once we have parallelized and processed all our hashes to ensure that the final state is correct, we just send that back to a leader, who will then decide to commit the block or not into a ledger.
to explain all of this in one very simple sentence, proof of history works because the hash generation process using a CPU has to be sequential and is much slower, while the hash verification process can be parallelized using GPU cores. And as long as this restraint holds true, proof of history will continue to work. All right, so we know how blocks are generated now. We know how validator nodes ensure that the block is legitimate. So let's wrap it up all together and see how uh, consensus work. So as we all know, all cryptocurrencies are decentralized. It's essentially trying to solve something called a Byzantine fault. Every node does not trust each other. There's a very real possibility, especially since we're doing finances, that people are trying to scam you and take your coins away. So all nodes work on the assumption that they can't trust each other. And so how Solana and all other proof of staking protocols work is that they require a majority of validator nodes to agree that the blockchain generated is legitimate. Otherwise, that node is tossed away and the validator and the node that proposed it is penalized. Let's take a quick look at this. All right, here's our high-level diagram again. We have our validator nodes, they have their final state, and now they're sending it back to the leader. And this is how the leader handles this. In order to commit the block, we need to reach something called a supermajority. Essentially, that is when two-thirds of all soul, of all stakes soul, so in this case, we have a total of 300 souls because we have three validator nodes, and let's say each validator node has 100 souls staked to it. So we need to have a generated final state, let's call it final state one, that has two-thirds of all staked soul supporting it. So in this case, validator one and two generate the state final state one, and combined, they have 200 soul. And now we have this malicious node, validator three, which generated this final state two, and it has 100 soul. So because final state one has two thirds, 200 soul, that the majority reach consensus and this block is saved to the ledger. And then the vote from validator three is rejected. Now let's go through another example. Let's say validator three actually has 200 soul instead, and it continues to vote for final state two. When this happens, final state one is also rejected because it no longer has the majority and we're kind of stuck at a tiebreaker. So how do we deal with these bad actors? Well, we have a timeout. And so one, one example is let's, assuming that we, a validator three is not malicious. So after a couple of timeouts where validator three didn't vote for anything, let's say five, it wasn't really specified what the timeout value is, but it's a most likely a configurable value. But let's say after missing five votes, then the network will decide to remove validator three because it's no longer participating in it. And so as a result, instead of having a total of 400 Solana in this network, so instead of having 400 staked soul in this network, we have a total of 200 now, which will allow us to reach supermajority. So another example is we have something called slashing. So slashing is the act of penalizing nodes for generating invalid blocks by taking away the staked soul. The white paper mentioned two specific scenarios. One is if a node voted for multiple states. So for example, if let's say Battery 3 decided to send to a leader node two votes instead of the one it was supposed to. It voted for some final state two and some final state three. And when this happened, Battery 3 is penalized for trying to cheat the system and they would get their Solana confiscated. Another clever way for Solana to deal with bad actors is that they purposely send fake hashes to ensure that the node's actually doing the work. Because you can imagine that the leader node would just send the final state. The validator node could theoretically, instead of calculating the whole hash function chain, it would just say yes and return the final state that it was given. It doesn't even have to spend the computer resources to calculate it. And to prevent this, periodically, the leader nodes would actually generate a fake hash, a fake final state. And so in this specific situation, Validator one and two are do, doing the correct thing and they're calculating it and they realize that this is an incorrect state and so they don't vote. But we have a malicious validator three which doesn't care and they just return the final state back. And whenever this happens, the validator node that does that will get slashed and have their Solana confiscated again. And that's the two ways that Solana handles malicious actors. Okay, I think at this point we should have a pretty good idea of Sol how Solana works now. In, in theory, that can just work in perpetuality until the end of time. However, distributed systems never work perfectly. You can imagine that one of the nodes might go down or uh, the leader nodes might go down and there's just a lot of problems. So we need to rely on something called the cap theorem to decide how our node cluster will work in the event that something goes wrong.
The cap theorem is something used in distributed system to decide three properties of how a network works. So we have consistency, which ensures that users will always see the same data even after an update or a delete. So if I, uh, for example, add $100 to my bank account, I better expect that whenever I look at it afterwards that that $100 will be in there. We have availability, which ensures that all users will be able to see a replica of the data, even in case of partial failures. So an example would be, let's say I send that $100 back into the bank. If I were to look at it again, potentially depending on which node I talk to, which server I talk to actually, I might actually see my old account balance. The difference between availability and consistency, if I try to do that in a consistency system, I won't actually even be able to view. I'll be just waiting for the screen to load until that update has been successful. The final letter in our cap theorem is P, partitioning. Partitioning ensures that a system continues to work ex as expected, even in presence of a partial network failure. Uh, in cap theorem, we have to essentially pick two of these three. And because we are working with a distributed system and we don't, and we want to always ensure that our system continues to work, we always need to ensure that we have partitioning. So essentially the only choice that we can have is we can either have a consistent and partitioned service or available in partition service. So let's dive into the only two viable solutions, CP and AP. CP or consistency partitioning, essentially an example of this is let's say we have our server and we have three databases. So our server updates the data to database two. Database two would then propagate that same update to database one and database three. And let's say another server comes along and it's trying to make a read request for that data while, while it's also being updated. And there's different levels of consistency. In this case, we're assuming we have strong consistency. So when this server tries to read the data, it would fail to read, or specifically, it would just kind of stall and be blocked because we don't want to read any stale data. That's how CP works. Now let's talk about AP or availability partitioning. And so when you choose availability, let's go back to that same scenario, okay? We are in the middle of updating data that we sent to database two it's being propagated. We have two servers and they're making a read request. The first server to database one and the second server to database three. And so we can actually have two results. So server one might actually read from database one, which has already updated itself with the newest data. So we'll get the new data, but server two might read it and database three might not have received the newest update yet. So it'll receive the old data. And so that's roughly cap theorem in a theory. Uh, so that's so that's roughly speaking cap theorem in a nutshell. So which one does Solana decide to use? Let's find out. So read the white paper in uh, section three network design. If we scroll down, this is the lovely picture I stole. Uh, if we read this last paragraph, in terms of cap theorem, consistency is almost always picked over availability in the event of a partition. So that solves that. Solana uses CP. And then if we further scroll down to section five. 510, when uh, reading about availability, it says a uh, cap system that deals with partitions have to pick consisting, consistency or availability. Our approach eventually picks availability, but because we have an objective measure of time, consistency is picked with a reasonable human timeout. And then it kind of goes into how uh, the proof of stake works with the different partitioning side of the network. Don't worry about reading all of this. I have a diagram to show how this works. All right, so before we continue on, I'm going to give the disclaimer that I am not a distributed system expert. Uh, so there are many people that are much smarter than me, but I do have a, a bone to pick with the white paper saying that Solana is, is a CP system. I don't think Solana is a CP architecture. I feel like it's more of an AP. If, for example, if you were to send Solana to someone else, I could theoretically imagine that, that while uh, that transaction is being processed, you can quickly go look at the re receiver's balance and see that they haven't received anything. So maybe they have a weaker form of consistency, I don't know, but I feel like saying that it's a, it's a strongly consistent is not exactly accurate. But then again, what do I know? Continuing on. All right, so when what do we do when dealing with partitions? We need to always ensure that our network is available. So in this case, availability, what happens if we have a network issue and not all available nodes can vote? And what Solana essentially does is slows down the block generation process and wait for the nodes to recover. So in the white paper, there are three states that were proposed. 
So the first state is if the number of verifier nodes that we have available in the whole network is greater than two thirds of the network. So when this is happening, we can have a very quick unstaking process using a low timeout. So in this diagram, we have our network. We have five validator nodes trying to validate blocks sent by the leader. And validator and validators two through five are sending the state. And let's say in this instance, validator one died and is no longer responding back to the leader. And because we have over two thirds of our network still working, for example, with these three, doesn't matter, we can quickly just unstake and remove validator one. All right, so in the second scenario, let's say what happens if the number of validator nodes we have is less than two thirds of the total network, but greater than one half the network. Well, at this point, because we no longer have supermajority, we can no longer reach consensus. So what we have to do is we just have to have a longer timeout and just have the leader just generate more hashes and we'll try to wait for the nodes to come back. We don't want to immediately just kick the validator ones and two out because if we do that, we can quickly reduce our pool of stake Solana, which then potentially could lead to a, a malicious person taking over the whole Solana network because they just happen to have the only set of valid nodes left. And so how Solana handles this is that it, it slows the timers so we give nodes more time to recover. And so the final state, which is when we the number of validator nodes we have is less than half the network. It's very similar to the previous state uh, that we talked about. The difference is that once we are below half network, we have to wait even longer for these validator nodes to come back because we don't want to try we don't want to consolidate the consensus to just the two remaining nodes, validator four and five. But of course, even if we waited for an extra long amount of time and the validator nodes never come back, we have no choice at the end but to unstake them and just allow validator four and five to carry on. So now we have an idea of what CAF theorem is and how Solana handles network outages. It'll be actually very interesting to see what brought down the Solana network in the past. Is it actually an architectural problem with proof of history or is it something more because of just bugs that people wrote? If I'm a betting man, I'm willing to guess it's probably something related with bugs because so far, at least from what I read from the white paper and the other documentation, proof of history in Solana seems pretty sound to me. So there's actually one last thing I wanna talk about in this video and that involves scaling the Solana architecture. How do we handle more users using the Solana network? I came in with some negative assumptions, but was very pleasantly surprised by uh, what was detailed in the white paper. So let's take a look. Okay, so to understand scaling and how Solana handles a growing amount of users, we need to understand the concept of vertical scaling and horizontal scaling. So what Solana does is it uses uh, vertical scaling. And what vertical scaling is, is you can imagine we have a node, it's our leader node generating hashes using proof of history. And what vertical scaling is, is whenever we hit a cap limit to the number of uh, transactions we can process, we just simply add more RAM, CPU, and GPU to our computer and to our servers. And this is the flack that Solana always gets. All of their verifier nodes are super expensive and only rich people or people with a lot of soul can actually afford to even run these validator nodes. But at least from a distributed system point of view on this, this is actually a more ideal situation versus horizontal scaling, which we'll talk about later. So there are two benefits of using vertical scaling. Uh, one is that it's far, far, far more simple than using a horizontal, a horizontal scaling solution. We'll see why. We get to take advantage of technological advancement. Uh, as you can imagine, as the years go by, we'll have better and better hardware that we can add and ensure that all of our nodes can just automatically process more transactions without doing any extra work. And of course, as you might imagine, that goes back to our main complaint, which is only the rich people can afford the validator nodes. So what are some of the detriments? First, we already talked about, new hardware is expensive. It's not just as simple as just adding another four gigs of RAM. If we were to move from you know, 16 to 32 gigs of RAM, it's exponentially more expensive. So we have expensive servers. And the second problem is we are still technically bounded by our hardware limitation. Um, no matter what we do, until we have better hardware, we're basically capped at a certain uh, level of transactions per second, which is not good for Solana's aspiration to one day take over Wall Street. So how might Solana handle this? Well, I'm happy to report that uh, going through the white paper, there actually was mention of a horizontal scaling solution. So let's understand what horizontal scaling is. So uh, back in our previous example, we have one liter node. So if we want to scale horizontally, uh, instead of just getting a better CPU, we just add more servers. So when we have multiple servers, each of these nodes all act as a leader and they can all process different transactions together. And so in theory, it allows us to handle unlimited amounts of transactions from the users. 
And so the benefits of doing this is twofold. One, whenever we have uh, any bottlenecks in our transaction per second, just throw it in our server, no problem. And then we just handle X more users. Another benefit is that these servers, it doesn't have to be the high-end server. It can, it can just be the computer that you're using right now. And that will allow our, uh, the Solana network to be much cheaper. So now that brings us to the complication. This all sounds great. But now that we have multiple leaders using proof of history, we have a big problem. This breaks proof of history. Because each server acts independently of each other, we now no longer know the actual ordering of the blocks that are being produced and when the transaction comes in. And so how do we solve this problem? Well, in the white paper, there is a hypothetical solution that talks about this, which is great. Here is an existing uh, diagram of user interaction with the Solana network. So we have one leader. So in a horizontal scaling solution, we would have multiple leaders. So let's say we have, uh, no, let's say we have a leader A. And leader A generates hash 100A and hash 101A. So that's the basic diagram. So now let's imagine we have multiple leaders now. So we have leader, oh, let me move myself over here. So now we have leader A, B, and C, and each leader will generate the hash with their own letter appended onto the end of it. So each of these leader will continuously generate hashes and use the hash as the input for the next hash. So according to the white paper, what each of these leader, leader node does is that every once in a while, they'll actually try and synchronize with each other. Uh, what, so how we would synchronize is that, uh, let's say leader A would send its current hash, its current state and time to leader B, which then will hash both that value that it receives along with the hash that it is currently at to generate the next hash, which in this instance, let's say it's just hash 100B. At this point, let's say we send hash 99A. Everything that happened prior to hash 99A has to have occurred before hash 100B. So with this, we have a way to reason about what occurred first. Now, uh, we continue this and let's say hash 100 uh, leader B synchronized with leader C and send hash 100B to it. And then we combine hash 100B with hash 100C to get hash 101C. And, you know, as a result of this, uh, because of transitivity, uh, we, all, we now know for sure that uh, everything from hash 100B and before it must have happened before hash 101C. And also because hash 100B is made from hash 99A over here, we know that everything that happened from hash 99A and before that must have happened before hash 101C. And so there are still some you know, dependency issues like, well, what about hash 100C? And I'm sure there must be a lot more study done into this. So currently as it stands, proof of history is a vertical scaling solution. So we don't have to deal with the complexity of this. But I imagine one day as we hit the limits of vertical scaling, we might start either looking into a horizontal scaling solution like what was proposed over here, or maybe we'll look up some sort of other side chains that will help handle this. It'll be interesting nonetheless to see how this all plays out in the future. So I'm very excited for that. All right, if you made it to this part of the video, well, first, thank you for sticking with me for this long, but you have finally understand a little bit more of Solana. Yes, a little bit. Because while I was reading through all the Solana documentation and the white paper, I realized there was so, so much more that I was not able to cover with the implementation detail. I felt that I was able to cover a pretty good relative deep dive of how Solana works, um, but not in its whole entirety, which I imagine no one single mortal can ever accomplish. So before I end this video, I just want to give a couple of thoughts uh, going through the whole process. So overall, um, I actually started this whole entire thing with a pretty uh, negative connotation. I actually had no idea how uh, crypto works in general, to be honest. No idea how proof of history works, proof of staking, proof of work. But after going through all this research and making this video, I've actually have a much better idea how the world works. And, and to be honest, I'm actually surprised. Uh, when I first came in, I came in there, I came with the assumption that cryptocurrency in general is basically just a public database like honestly why are we even using this besides you know watching the coin go up and getting rich but after finally understanding some of the core problems that we're trying to solve like the visiting fault and ensuring that we have a true decentralized uh, cluster of nodes I, I can understand why certain decisions have been made and that makes a lot of sense and this actually clarified one big doubt I have with Solana which is proof history is it really as great as we say it is well the answer is yes, actually it is. Um, not being able to have a order 
a timestamp order of nodes being created and not having to wait. Actually, it seems to be a big game changer from what I read compared to the other uh, blockchain technologies. Uh, so coming out of this, I actually am a lot more bullish now on Solana in general versus when I started coming in thinking it was just a load of smoke and mirrors. The one thing that I was actually very impressed about was just having a horizontal scaling solution. Because what I did understand this during this whole process was that we just had a vertical scaling solution with just one node. And I thought, well, that's not sustainable. Eventually we're going to hit a upper limit and we can't continue anymore. Well, it turns out that's not the case. Uh, Solana does, at least in theory, have an idea how they would scale horizontally if they had the unfortunate circumstance to ever reach that point. Because, because I can tell you from a normal distributed system in Web2, that is a nightmare. So if you found this video helpful, I greatly appreciate it if you give it a like. And if you're not subscribed, you know, consider maybe hitting that sub button. But until then, uh, stay tuned for my more regular scheduled content if I ever get that far. All right, see ya.